For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Okay, looks like we are live on Late Night with Standing for Truth. Um, I know, it. like I said, it's a late one. It's almost 4 a.m., but it's, uh, it's good to still see people in the chat. We got the party animal. We got the uh, Young Earth Creation Party Animals. We've got Big Bad Tony. Tony, it's, it's safe to say nobody is going to be taking the Abiogenesis Challenge, brother. They've admitted defeat. Doki Doki, good to see you. The Super Sticker Master, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Heaven says, yo, yo, yo. How's it going? God bless everybody. Doki Doki says, we need to start... A fresh pot of coffee here. <laughs> That's precisely why I'm doing a bit of a late night stream because I did have a late night coffee. The wife and I watched a movie. I had a coffee. Um, my wife loves baking. So, you know, some baked goods with the coffee. So I'm all pumped. Uh, kind of spur of the moment stream. I was just sitting back, relaxing. I thought it was so funny how horribly the critics have failed <laughs> like it's it's pretty bad and there's just a few arguments that they seem to parrot even though it's been so sufficiently demolished so you know this stream I'll probably go for an hour uh, i don't want to keep everybody up all night but um we're going to have some visuals. It's going to be interactive. So I'm going to make this as fun as can be at four in the morning. So anyways, announcement wise, as you can see here, Dr. Rob Stadler educates Professor Dave on abiogenesis. I love this thumbnail. So we're actually going to be recording it tomorrow night. It's going to be awesome. You guys are not going to want to miss it. Uh, we're not going to record it live. Um, we're going to just do a little bit of editing as well, make sure it's as perfect as can be. And then we are going to premiere it on Saturday night. It sounds like, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I'm almost done Dr. Stadler's, uh, book that he just wrote on evolution and it's phenomenal. He makes some great points. So we're going to be interviewing him as well. Not this weekend, probably maybe next week, hopefully. But we got some solid interviews that were just uh, in the last moments of confirming. We've also got uh, the rescheduling of Dr. Ken Hoven and Derek Barnes. That's still going to be taking place October 8th. And if you have not yet checked it out, please check out the interview with Dr. Rob Carter. Phenomenal interview. We made sure we asked all the tough questions. He had amazing answers. It's already over 1.1 thousand views in just a couple days. I definitely want everybody to check it out. So let's see how the chat is doing. Um, Tony. Tony says, Professor Dave thinks he demolish James tour. Yeah. We challenge professor Dave for one to take the abiogenesis challenge, answer our specific questions, refute the Dr. Hayes, Ryan Hayes interview. Tony and I are just dying for somebody to take the abiogenesis challenge. We're going to have Dr. Hayes back on. Heck we could have an entire army. We'll have Dr. Stadler on and we will demolish um, the answers provided in regards to whoever takes the challenge so we're looking forward to it um yeah Pro professor dave seems to have retired after one debate with kent 
Um, he doesn't seem to be accepting any other debate challenges. So, Tony, you especially, brother, you're not going to want to miss tomorrow night, like I said, is where we are going to record it. But Saturday night, you're not going to want to miss out on it. It's going to be awesome. Conrad Kopech, good to see you. Good to see you. Okay, so why don't we uh, get right into this? We're going to be addressing a few things. Um, you know, I'm going to give you guys a visual here real quick. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so I think everybody can see this. Before we get into some uh, a couple of clips I want to play, I wanted to just kind of go over a, a few things here. And I thought this visual, this uh, mitochondrial DNA phylogenetic chart um, would be a good place to start. So if you want to follow along here, what's funny is Evolutionists look at this and they say all of these DNA differences, right, which uh, in the uniparentally inherited DNA, like the mitochondrial DNA, would be a reflection of mutations over time, okay? So evolutionists would say that this all occurred hundreds of thousands of years ago, okay? And of course, they say humans and chimpanzees, they always assume this. And we've gone into this at great lengths, uh, me and brother Ramat, where they assume they have phylogenetic assumptions. They are using the phylogeny method, not measurable mutation rates. And they always assume chimp human relationship. The chimp human split about 6.5 million years ago. So uh, this is a given according to deep time evolution. Now, even though chimps and humans are so incredibly different, they still assume this. Okay, because you can't question the bigger picture. That's what I find hilarious. Um, I mean, off the cuff, we can look at the Y chromosome incredibly. When we actually consider the entirety of the Y chromosome, gene content, architecture, size differences, we are looking at less than 35% dissimilarity. And yet humans and chimps. Uh, chimps are supposed to be our closest common ancestor. And the Y chromosome is non-recombining DNA for the most part. It should be relatively stable. And yet less than 35% dissimilar. And you got to love these critics. Uh, Guts a Gibbon, for example, Dr. Dan Cardinal, Aaron Ra. I mean, the storyboards that they come up with to explain the data is hilarious. And Dr. Carter talked about this the other day. Praise I am that I am in the house, our thumbnail creating master. Good to see you, praise. I hope your stream was well tonight, brother. Always a pleasure. Um, we're well. Okay, another thing that comes to mind too, the mitochondrial DNA, which is what this phylogenetic tree is, is nothing alike either. Dr. Carter in the interview the other day that please, if you haven't seen it, go watch it again, talks about how they're nothing similar. And he's actually looked at these. He's got the data on his computer, you know, the sequences. He's aligned them. He's assessed them. He's analyzed them. They're nothing alike. So we got Y chromosome dissimilarity, mitochondrial DNA dissimilarity, not to mention linkage blocks, orphan genes, gene function, epigenetic differences, differences in gene expression like it's really really bad for the evolutionists which is why go check our playlist playlist refuting the critic series playlist i mean we've got well over 20 videos in there and you know these guys are cornered and they don't realize that us on this channel we're warriors we like the fight we like the battle we like the war so um if they pop their head back up and finally give a response now if they do remember team dodgeball um, what's the model? What's the five D's of dodge, dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. That's what they do, you know, and it's to deceive their audience into thinking that they've actually responded when they've done quite the, the opposite. So yeah, we are, we like the battle. We love the war. So if they do pop their heads back up, we will make sure that we address every argument that we have to, um, one video that comes to mind, check it out. Um, build your own hominid. So that was pretty funny. Come in, uh, hopefully this Christmas for only $25, any one of you can get your own garbage bag of bones and you can build an ape man, you can build an ape, you can build a human. It's, it's, it's all about how fragmented these bones are. So that's a funny video to definitely check out. But yeah, as I was saying, it's bad for the evolutionists, okay? Now, looking at this chart, 
um, this entire, let's say, couple hundred thousand of, of years for the human MT DNA differences is all based on an assumption. Like I said earlier, they rely on phylogenetic assumptions and not actually based on observed mutation rates, which we know are fast. Okay, please go watch the video that, uh, the, I should say videos that Ramad and I have done recently going into every single pedigree-based study, going into incredible detail. I'm just gonna go over this really quick. Um, the critics, of course, they've tapped out, but if they do want to respond, they have a lot to respond to. And we will know if they're dodging. Dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge. So good to see a lot of people in the chat, even at this time. Joe Wilson, good to see you, sister. Rahman in the house, good to see you. Um, yeah, Tony, Aaron Ra is free to take the abiogenesis challenge. He's not gonna. And if he does, let's get ready for some storyboards. But we're not in the mood for storyboards. We're in the mood for empirical science. That's what we like here, empirical science. So, um, yeah, so they assume... Okay, even though the mitochondrial DNA mutates fast, okay, when we look at measured mutation rates, the evolutionists assume chimp human ancestry. And so they, they look at the differences, okay, look at the chart here. And they say the mitochondrial DNA differences that we're looking at here, they assume these differences are a measure of time, even though there is no way in heck they can account for this many DNA differences and even six million years, 10 million years. These amount of fixations just will not happen. Okay, evolution is actually dead mathematically and that is a fact. This has been proven over and over and over and over again, even if we are conservative with the amount of differences that separate humans and chimps. They wanna ignore so much of the genomes, right? Let's just say 30 million DNA differences roughly. You're not gonna fixate that many DNA differences. There's just no way the mathematics have not been done. Too many problems. Evolution is mathematically dead. Um, so let's see. So as I've said, uh, when it comes to the math, it's been proven over and over again. Now, what they do is they take these DNA differences, okay, and they divide the number by the assumed split, so about 6.5 million years. This means we are looking at an incredibly slow mutation rate. Okay. And it's so funny, the storyboards that they come up with too, because some of your pedigree based mutation rates, because we wouldn't expect every single pedigree based study looking at the measurable mutation rate, the empirical method from generation to generation, we wouldn't expect them all to just land right on 6,000 years, 7,000 years. No, but it's going to be relatively early versus the deep time evolution story, which says 100,000 years, 150, 200,000 years, nowhere near those huge numbers. So that's why the storyboards that they come up with when it comes to mutation rates, substitution rates, fixation, for example, is quite funny. It's not science. Um, so yeah, they'll divide the number by the assumed split 6.5 million years ago. Like I said, we're looking at an incredibly slow mutation, rate, way slower than what we see today. Now, look at this tree, okay? This is only a reflection of, of only thousands of years. There's not a lot of mutations on this tree. Not a lot at all, okay? So without evolutionary-based assumptions, the clear and obvious conclusion is what? That this tree is young. Doki Doki, thanks so much for the super stick. Four bucks, that's going to buy me a lot of coffees. Like I said, I had a coffee a little bit late into the night, so I'm pumped for this stream. Um, yeah, so that's the clear and obvious conclusion. We're not running around, you know, trying to come up with ways to force fit the mitochondrial DNA data into our model. Well, that's what the evolutionists are doing, okay? And it's so funny, these critics are just trying so desperately. They're dodging, they're ducking, they're dipping, they're dodging, they're diving to refute us and to give better evidence, better predictions. When yet they're the ones that are always force fitting the data. It's all about post hoc, ad hoc, rescue devices, stories. So we have no real reason to, Brother George, good to see you. Good to see you. We've just been going over many reasons why humans and chimps are clearly not related, which the evolutionist assumes when it comes to mitochondrial DNA mutations, Y chromosome mutations, molecular clocks in general. Like when you're looking at this tree, you can read in their papers, they always assume the split. Well, there's plenty of reasons for us to not 
assume the split okay this tree here once again anybody who just jumped in you can see there's not a lot of mutations in this tree okay now dr carter actually he ex he explains it, it, it incredibly well and matt and i in our video i believe it was tight it was debunking uh, guts a given it was titled created or evolved and we showed a video of Dr. Carter explaining and even going over the mitochondrial DNA tree. I'm just kind of explaining it in a, in a nutshell. When he, when he explains that when we look at the human family tree, George, brother George, thank you for the $5 super chat. Coffee for Matt. Anytime Raw Matt, uh, I like when Raw Matt drinks coffee because he, he goes on overdrive. He gets aggressive and destroys these evolutionists, but he destroys them either way, coffee or no coffee. Um, I get pretty hyper on coffee. Maybe that's why I love it so much. So thank you, George. You're the man. Good to see you. So anyways, Dr. Carter, he explains. You can go look at, at that video too. Created or evolved. There's been no rebuttal to it no refutation they've tapped out so now take let's take two people okay two people who have the same great 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 grandmother let's say i'm just summarizing here of course this isn't word for word what robert carter says but it's more or less now let's look at their mitochondria okay and see how different they are Let's look at how, how many mutations they have. That's what this tree is. It's a reflection of DNA differences and mutations. Dr. Carter points out that on average, there's about one mutation. Now this is average, okay? So more or less one mutation every other generation. This means that this tree that you're looking at here is only a few hundred generations. What a coincidence. What a coincidence that this is exactly where the biblical Eve is. Isn't that funny? Not to mention that all mitochondrial DNA is incredibly similar. We're looking at low genetic variation. Nothing like the chimpanzees. We have low genetic diversity, which is why they invented post hoc, mind you, the out of Africa population bottleneck, the storyboard. Why chromosomes are geographically specific. We have traces of Babel in our genetics. Uh, why chromosomes have incredible low variation. There's no ancient or highly mutated Y chromosomes. Another question we've been asking the evolutionists that they can't answer. It's, it's really bad right now for deep time evolution and really, really bad for those that want to hold to deep time evolution. So, um, yeah, brother Ramat, you don't live too far away. Come join me. We'll have some coffee. <laughs> it's always a good time refuting evolutionists, even at 4 a.m. So the fact is evolutionists don't use measurable mutation rates, okay? When you look at this tree, plain and simple, okay, one, the uh, young earth creation position when it comes to mutation rates leads to testable predictions. That's the gold standard of science, but they want to play all these games with substitution rates, assuming archaeological events, assuming the geological column, assuming the human chimp split, assuming deep time. You know, just look at the empirical data evolutionists. Okay, just look at the tree. You know, this is the same for the Y chromosome. There's not a lot of mutations there. We don't have anything to explain as young earth creationists. So, um, oh, definitely check out um, <laughs> Exposing Villains to Christianity, R and Ra. So we had a great, that one's going to be a couple thousand views soon. We really gave it to R and Ra, destroyed every single argument. Uh, he'll definitely be forced to respond anybody who just got here this weekend dr rob stadler educating professor dave on abiogenesis so we are pumped um yeah why don't we get into good to see everybody in the chat let's get into some visuals here what i'm gonna do real quick is um no, i'm gonna share screen and i find this funny because I'm constantly going over the evolutionists and their best arguments. I went over the blog last uh, last week, couple weeks ago, and the Filthy Monkey Men blog. It's it's the blog that the evolutionists don't want you to see. And what I find is hilarious is there's been no critique of it. No rebuttal to what I said. And I just went over the fact that all of these arguments, okay, that damage control, Dan, Evo Grad, Herman Mays, 
Joshua Swami Das, Erica, because she's just parroting the rest of them. They're all recycling the same already debunked arguments. And years ago on this Filthy Monkey Men blog, which I went over in detail and analyzed in a previous video, Dr. Jensen destroyed them and responded to every single one of their arguments. And people in the, in the uh, comment section were begging for a response to Dr. Jensen and they didn't get any. So um, yeah, anyways, I just wanna show you how easy it is to even refute their so-called best, okay? Your Dr. Dr. Joshua Swamidas, your some um, uh, theistic evolutionist, let's say from BioLogos. Uh, damage control, Dan, is, uh, we've quickly realized that he doesn't have much to offer, but yeah, so this has to do with the, if you can see here on the screen, this is on the Peaceful Science discourse page, okay? Dr. Swamidas invited me there and, I realized quick that they're, they're so easy to refute. You give them, even, th even these participants on this blog, I find it funny that they criticize people like Dr. Jensen so profoundly, so militantly, but then they say they don't have time or they don't want to, you know, submit their critique and their objections to AIG for Jensen to respond like he did to Frello. You know, they don't have time. And what's funny is <laughs> they've got time to spend uh, in a blog, like in this blog, um, it seems like they spend all day in here, you know, but they, but they don't have time to critique Dr. Jensen and AIG. So yeah, I just want to show you how easy it is to refute even their best. So what I've learned here, I've only engaged in a couple posts, okay? And after hours, I guess, doing it, I, I prefer live live debate, live dialogue. You realize that they're dodging, they're dipping, they're ducking, they're dodging, team dodgeball. So my advice to anybody who likes to respond to the evolutionists in comment sections or blogs, answer their arguments, present your own arguments, address their objection, ask your questions. But once it gets to the point where they're clearly ignoring the arguments, they're dodging, they're asking the same questions over and over again. I mean, we know as creationist apologists, Ron Matt's in the chat, how many times have we answered the same question over and over again? You, know, you can only answer the same question over and over again in the, in the same blog post or the same comment section. So what you do, you expose them. But what they want to do is they want to do a 10 on one and they want to drain you and they want you to answer the same questions over and over again. They don't want to answer your questions. Give enough where your um, observer or somebody who just comes across the blog will read it and see that these evolutionist critics have been destroyed and then don't go back because it'll be, it'll be never ending. So that's why I thought this one was hilarious. So I'm going to... So it started off, you can see here, my video, there's been no response. Dr. Dan dodged, docked, dipped, dived, and dodged all over the place on this one. So a linkage, a disequilibrium, definitely check that one out, out of Africa or out of Middle East. So uh, let's see here. So yeah, they had no art, they gave no rebuttal, but they posted in here. So they were triggered enough. So I started to engage them because Dr. Swamidas, he likes to use this what's called TMR4A argument, okay? Now, here's the thing. He wants to pretend that it assumes created heterozygosity. And I explained in this blog, you guys can read it. I'll, I'll post it in the, uh, we'll leave it here at good old Swamidas. Now, Swamidas, you know, he's, yeah, I don't see him really addressing anything. Ignores the molecular clocks from, uh, mitochondrial DNA Y chromosome gives no predictions of his own, never addresses the bigger picture, looks at this TMR for a argument. Okay. And this is funny. You're going to see, they're going to concede it. And their secondary argument will be recombination rates are too slow. Well, I got a good clip from Dr. Carter the other day. I've addressed this, but this is good. This is gold. So the real created heterozygosity hypothesis, this is more or less what I commented here, okay? It suggests millions of heterozygous gene sites. You guys have heard this over and over again. Now, first of all, it comes down to defining alleles correctly too, okay? Alleles should be correctly defined as versions of a gene when we define it correctly. Now, in a gene, there's, there's many DNA positions, of course, so... Um, many alleles. This means that many, many alleles can arise from a created heterozygosity model. Now, here's the thing. From this definition, 
let's say the position definition of allele to not confuse the evolutionists, okay? There would be millions of lines, there, there'd be millions of lineages, I should say, in both Adam and millions of in Eve, okay? There's not just four alleles. Now, which alleles are we converging on? Because this whole TMR4A, for anybody who, who doesn't understand it yet or hasn't heard a de definition, I've addressed it in a few videos and clearly they're getting triggered here. Now, here's the thing. This TMR4A, it does not assume what I'm going to call the real created heterozygosity model. It pretends because this analysis time to most recent four alleles, okay, is tracing the origin of what? That's right, our autosomal our nuclear DNA differences back in time. And this analysis incorporates both recombination and mutation. They say recombination is a problem for us, but we're gonna address that in a bit. Um, the researcher doing this analysis, okay, can then follow lineages and this TMR4A point is actually where four lineages are present. This is the way I explained it to Swami Das here too, and he agreed. Um, this would be where four lineages are present in the human population. What point would this be, though, according to the Adam and Eve model that assumes front-loaded genetic diversity, the created heterozygosity hypothesis? Well, this would be a point where two lineages could be present in Adam, okay, in a heterozygous state, and also two in Eve in a heterozygous state as well. But guess what? The entire analysis treats every DNA difference as the result of mutation. Because all it's really doing, it's it's a sophisticated population genetics analysis, but it's it's simply just the fact that they're tracing their mutational heritage in a more sophisticated way. And based on what we've talked about in great detail for many, many, many hours worth of streams, this design diversity hypothesis treats millions of DNA variants as what? The result of de novo creation. So if we were to just accept the terms by Swami Das here used in the TMR for a analysis, the real created heterozygosity model, not the straw man, not the one that the TMR for a pretends to assume, we would be looking at what? Millions of lineages in Adam and millions in Eve. So this whole 500,000 year date that they think the TMR for a analysis demonstrates is false. And this is also why they want to ignore the mitochondrial DNA, the Y chromosome, the molecular clocks. I just went over what, 20, 30 minutes there, the, the mitochondrial DNA phylogenetic tree. There's only a few mutations there, you know? Um, so they don't want to address this data. They don't want to make any, um, any predictions of their own. So we go here. I want to go to their main argument when they... So we're going to scroll down here, definitely check it out. So, so here's another thing that I'm trying to explain to Swami Das here on the correct definition of allele, okay? Because here's the issue. And I explain it to him here, and he just says wall of text. Well, guess what? This is because I've answered the same question over and over again. Look at, by definition, genes consist of more than one DNA position. So which is it? Is an allele a version of a particular DNA position or a version of a gene that contains hundreds to thousands of DNA positions? Jensen's response to Frello, but this can also be a response to any of these guys. Um, so let's see. Yeah, so right here, as you can see, I point out if an allele is defined as a single genomic position, independent of its relationship to a gene, then enormous allelic diversity can be generated. Now. Let's see here. So we go down. Now I want to point out that Swami Das is kind of confused. And he thinks that we are invoking what's called a mosaic, um, mosaic Eve. Okay. When in the fact is that we don't need to, based on the data that we're actually looking at. Okay. And uh, Dr. Jansen in his model, he would affirm this. Based on the data we have now, it doesn't seem to be the case that we have any real reason to invoke created mosaicism, it's called, okay, in the gametes of Adam and Eve. Well, I'll get into that in a bit as to what that is. Um, so if you're following me here, eventually Evo grad, he, he understands what I'm saying for the most part and goes to the recombination argument. 
And this is what we are going to cover. Now, this is probably why people like Swami Das won't actually address Dr. Jensen in a written debate through AIG, of course. So anyways, here, what, what, uh, you know, he, right here, Evo grad. Okay, he's, he's one of the main ones they all look to and he's easily refuted. So he says, what TMR4A shows is that you would need to invoke rates of recombination mutation gene conversion, because I pointed out the fact that gene conversion would break up these alleles quicker, but also the fact, and he says it later on, because we point out that these design variants would obviously be ex expected to be created within functional and useful linkage blocks. They want to pretend to assume created heterozygosity, but then not follow it to its logical conclusion that God obviously would have placed these design variants, these functional alternatives in places in the genome where they can recombine, they can lead to change, variation, adaptation. See, this is why I say it pretends. They like to pretend. That's why all their, their arguments are storyboards. It's a pretend game with them. So don't buy into this whole, you know, assume created heterozygosity. Um, but here's the fact. OK, this is his main argument now. OK, this is why they say Evo Grad says at current rates, more than 500,000 years is required, <laughs> which is hilarious. He, he says, if you have all these densely packed heterozygous site, sites, then you need a lot of fine scale intragenic recombination to break them apart. Gene conversion helps with that and produce new alleles from the created heterozygosity. So anyways, point is you got to go down this far till they finally realize that they've been straw manning. I don't even know if Swami Das gets it yet. <laughs> so, but at least uh, Evil Grad did. Now here's the thing, okay? The allelic patterns we see today can be easily explained by the fact that we see what? Fast mutation rates. I covered that for 30 minutes in the beginning. Fast recombination rates, okay? Exceedingly fast actually in many African people groups for, for a few reasons. Um, uh, due to a specific working enzyme, actually, that assists in recombination. It's not as random as, as always assumed. The evolutionists, once again, are not up to date on the data and on the literature. And I am going to show you an, a, an awesome clip from Dr. Carter uh, with us in our interview where he covers this. But real quick, I want to point out that even gene conversion was going to help significantly. But yeah, the mitochondrial DNA, uh, the mutation rates, they're fast. But for evolution to be true, they would need to slow these numbers down, as I showed from that uh, mtDNA uh, mito, uh, phylogenetic tree. There's not a lot of DNA differences there. They need the storyboard, and it's hilarious. And they can't make testable predictions. Dr. D Damage Control Dan, he still hasn't addressed Ram raw Adamai's video from over a month ago where he provided us a paper, finally after a year of asking them, go check my third debate with Erica. I must ask her 10 times for a testable prediction because she just wanted to nitpick and her arguments have all been demolished. Um, she's not up to date on the literature. I'm not gonna rehash all the questions I have for her, but um, point is d damage control Dan has not answered our video where we showed conclusively that his so-called prediction was a retro addiction and once again assumes the human chimp split as we talked about at the beginning here. So for evolution to be true, they need to slow these numbers down exponentially by an order of magnitude and more. It's sad. We do not. We're not running around force fitting the data into our model. Okay. Now where all of this would speed up and not slow down would actually be done and accomplished during the biblical models to bottlenecks creation in the flood rapid genetic fixation it's a fact the numbers have been done look at the thumbnail on this video design diversity allele frequencies paper that they have no refutation for the numbers have been done you heard it from dr carter the other day they're not up to date here it is i got it in front of me adam and eve design diversity and allele frequencies um let's let's go to a video Actually, I'm just going to make sure that the audio guys let me know if I'm going to share screen and go to Nicholas. Good to see you, brother. You're a warrior, man. Everybody subscribe to him. Nicholas, got to have you on again soon. Good to see all the brothers in the chat. Um, so I'm going to share screen and show you where Dr. Carter 
Now, we've addressed this, but Dr. Carter really smashed it. This is their main argument, okay? So now, now they realize the TMR4A argument fails. Fails, okay? Um, but now the recombination rates are too slow, apparently. We're going to have to invoke. You heard Evograd, the one that they all go and parrot. Erica, in a video the other day, she literally said, you can't make this self up. You can't make this stuff up. She said, well, you know, Standing for Truth likes to use Dr. Jensen's predictions and his arguments, but all it takes is 30 minutes of Google to realize that, G that Jensen's a fraud, apparently. Can't make this stuff up. She said it. It's embarrassing. It's sad. She <laughs> So what she means by that is she Googles Nathaniel Jensen debunked. She comes across Filthy Monkey Men blog, which I spend an hour showing how wrong it is, how they haven't refuted Jensen's response to it. You'll also come across Evil Grad, okay? This is their idea of critical thinking, objective ways of approaching a dialogue and a debate. So here we go, Evil Grad, the one that they want to look to and parrot all the time. So I'm going to share audio. Boom. Make sure you guys can hear. We are going to right here. Boom. Just just uploaded this. Turn up the volume. Hopefully everybody can hear. So this is the recombination rates that um, Dr. Carter is going to expand on it. So let's see if Swami Das can uh, debunk this one or Evo grad. There we go. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. We can still use it if we want to. Okay. All right. Well, when it comes to recombination, it's been asserted that the rates are too slow to account for the de novo creation of Adam and Eve around 6,000 years ago. Is this an argument you can Well, what's the recombination rate? It depends on – we used to think it was random. It's not. It's controlled by a gene. The PRDM9 enzyme looks for a specific set of letters on the chromosome, grabs onto it, and recombines. Wow. Okay. Africans have more of those sites than Europeans. Oh. Wow. Whoa, 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 wait a minute now. Hold it. <laughs> that messes up the molecular clock right there. Because if you have more recombination per generation, your population can hold more diversity. You have more pieces of DNA in the population. So how long ago was this out of Africa event? Well, I don't know. If Africans have more recombination, they're going to look older just because of the amount of recombination. Right. And because mutation will destroy the PRDM9 sites over time, it's much more likely – I forget what the letter combination is, but it's much more likely to destroy it than to create it through a mutation. So our recombination rate should be slowing down over time. So, okay, so that would, and, and so many good points there that it, it makes, it brings a couple questions to mind. So that would, um, in effect, I've heard the critics say, okay, you know, the, the higher levels of genetic diversity found in Africa means Africans are older than non-Africans, but they also look to linkage blocks between Africans and non-Africans that they look at that and try and say that Africans are an older population as well and, and use that to support the out of Africa theory. So that looks like the re recombination rates would help with, uh, with those arguments too, Dr. Carter. Yeah. Plus we don't know how many people went to Africa after the flood. We don't know how many different groups migrated down there. Um, it looks like there was a massive replacement of people in Eurasia as the farmers learned how to farm in the Middle East, they started spreading out and they replaced the Neanderthals, they replaced the Denisovans, they replaced the, um, the ancient hunted gatherers. Most Europeans in ancient times had dark skin and blue eyes. We see that in all, the, all their DNA. And all of a sudden there's this massive replacement of light skinned people as they come in with farming. So we can't necessarily look at modern people and say, ah, this is what the original population looked like. Europeans are specifically 
we're inbred. We're one of the most inbred large populations on the planet. We yeah. Europeans came from a very small population group that took over a large area. There's not a lot of genetic diversity in Europe compared to specifically Africa or even the Middle East. Yeah, I saw one of the papers that was recently written. They discovered what they call Cheddar Man, and he had black yeah. skin, blue eyes. Well, so. well, when those letters appear in modern people, they're associated with darker skin tones. Mm. But it's not perfect. 23me.com says I'm supposed to have blue eyes. I uh, don't have blue eyes. <laughs> but I carry a variant that's very strongly associated with blue eyes. So the inference of how a person looked from their genetics is imprecise. And even if it works in a modern context, we don't know the ancient persons, all these other variants that we don't haven't really categorized yet. And if they're not around the world today, we don't know what they do. You can't necessarily say, but it does look like the evidence is pointing in the direction that the hunter-gatherer Europeans had darker skin, and a lot of them had blue eyes. Maybe. Man, well, uh, so one, one question real quick that comes to my mind is they say Neanderthal was a basically a ginger, red hair, pale, with freckles. Was that determined, again, by genes, by finding... Uh, yes and no. Neanderthals had a lot of diversity of, of pigmentation genes. They weren't ubiquitously red hair or light skinned. Um, but yeah. definitely some of them carried genes that look like they would have caused that because they're associated with those traits in modern people. Okay, let me fix this. So, in other words, rest in peace, TMR4A, rest in peace to the so-called follow-up argument on recombination rates. They're done, okay? We've got fast mutation rates, few fixed substitutions, fast recombination rates. They're slowing down, as you can see here, based on that specific enzyme that helps with recombination. It's not as random as they say. They're not up to date. It's sad. Fast gene conversion, which they always ignore. Fast genetic drift. There's no more argument. It's over. It's done. They need to tap out. They've already tapped out. It's obvious. Um, but yeah, definitely, <laughs> I find this hilarious that, and I'm so glad that this so-called, I'm going to go screen share again, that this, so when they finally, finally understood, and they, so, in this blog, remember, this is the best that they're going to have, okay? And, oh, right here, so Evograd. So, now, this is, this is where, guys, you want to end it, okay? You've debunked their arguments. They're dodging. They're dipping. They're ducking. They're diving. They're dodging. Team dodgeball, okay? Swami Das. I think I might actually promote him to... Team Dodgeball's MVP. You know, he's the new MVP. Um, congratulations. You've earned it. So, anyways, this is this is right around the time where you're gonna want to stop responding. Okay. You've destroyed them. They're not answering any questions. All their objections have been addressed, and they resort to dodgeball. Evograd says, define allele for us in the correct way. Okay, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> be as specific and detailed as possible he says you know it's it's even hard to to uh oh it's it's even hard to say this with a straight face okay <laughs> uh laughter is the best medicine so i point out this is where i ended okay unbelievable i say i have at least three times alone in this thread i am done here good talk boom and you can continue and you can see them just dodging and dipping and, and falling all over themselves okay it's funny it is really really funny um yeah and and this what i find funny is swami das wants people like dr carter dr jensen dr sanford to go in this 
peaceful science blog and argue with them all day, 10 on one. When, as you can see here, these guys can't even hold a candle to people like Sanford, Carter, Jensen. Did you see in that hour and a half interview with Dr. Carter, he didn't even break a sweat and he demolished all of their usual, typical, commonly used arguments. You think they're going to go waste their times in here with, with the team dodgeball? So anyways, yeah. So he says, you know, define the allele. Now, if you go look up here, I've got, I've got citation after citation. Even uh, Swami Das accusing me of providing too much data. See, that they're not looking for an answer. So right in here, look at this. This is all illegal. This is, you know. I, so EvoGrab wants me to waste more time, more time by um, answering the same question over and over again. Okay, here's the big issue, okay? Now, um, let's see. Oh, Brother Nicholas asked a question. Does Shadow Dancer, good to see you as always. Almost 5 a.m. We've got a lot of people in the chat. Awesome. Good to see you guys. This is too much fun for me. So this has been great. Um, yeah, we, we love debunking these critics, but uh, they got a lot of work to do. Please go, go to the playlist section. Go check out Refuting the Critics series. Go check out the um, couple episodes we've done on Another Evolutionist Bites the Dust. It's not looking good for them at all. Um, let's see. So brother Nicholas says, does Swami Das actually hang out with the rest of the team now? Dan, Erica, etc., Or is Swami Das doing his own thing? Uh, well, in this peaceful science page, Nicholas, this is his page. He started it. He's the, he's the boss here, but now they've all, when you go here, you're going to find like your CRISPR, your Evo grad, Guts of Gibbons in there, your Dan Cardi now, a lot of uh, PhD evolutionary biologists and stuff. So this this is all like, I guess, your big shots, quote unquote. So in a way, he's hanging out with the, the evolutionists, yes. Um, Daniel, you're right. Swami Das wrote a book, Shilling for Evolution. Go check Dr. Carter and Dr. Sanford's review of that book. They do a great job um, addressing all the points where he goes wrong. Uh, tonight, we're, we're addressing the science, the TMR4A, for example. Um, and let's see. N Nicholas says only two here. <laughs> That's true. My sock account and my mom, my only two supporters. So anyways, yeah. So the, this you can't make this stuff up. So as you can see here, you know, I go over allele in, in great detail. Because this is especially one thing that Swami Das doesn't. Uh, although he did correctly define it in an inter interview he did it the uh, did the other day yesterday, he defined it as um, specific genomic position. So that's good. But anyway, so here here's the issue. Okay, um, when it comes to defining an allele, anyways, it's kind of slippery and problematic. This is where the evolutionist goes wrong. Okay, now. If we only think about a single letter in the genome, then what we would be looking at obviously is four alleles at most, okay? But when we actually consider the entire gene, we are we are now looking at many numbers of alleles. You know what? Um, for more visual, I'm going to quote Dr. Sanford or Dr. Carter here. So he actually addresses this argument. So here's a question on genetic diversity and Noah's Ark, okay? Remember, there, there, there's no argument that hasn't been addressed or debunked. These guys are done. Now, we're, we're, bringing, we're putting the challenge to them on predictions, retrodictions, and, and they're failing. Um, somebody mentioned, oh, yeah, Brother Nicholas says, Swami Das is like an atheist. Yeah, pretty much. He even tried to argue for abiogenesis with James Tour. I mean, so where do you put God? It's such a joke. He says, and he's good friends with William Lane Craig. The world is getting smaller, weirder, and faster. What's so funny is I heard Do uh, William Lane Craig use such anti-scientific arguments. I mean, he, he tried to say that, you know, too much genetic diversity to explain um, in just a few thousand years coming from an Adam and Eve. And... Um, yeah, so let's see here. So the critic writes, let's see who it is. We'll make this interactive. Pete B from UK. 
probably secretly damage control Dan. <laughs> he's been banned so many times for asking the same question over and over again. He's got uh, he's got uh, some fake names. So uh, Pete B, aka Dan here. Um, I'm really disappointed in Dan's arguments. I thought he'd be more of a challenge, but I mean, it's, it's what you get from those that believe pine trees and whales are related. So here's the question from damage control Dan, probably. In a pair of animals on the ark, so we're looking at the ark here, the animals can only carry two alleles, each of a given gene, giving a maximum total of four alleles of a given gene. Okay, you can go read this. Dr. Carter, let's just quote him. If you are considering an entire, so this is more or less what I said in different words. Um, I've also quoted uh, Jensen, but it all essentially means the th same thing. So he says, if you are considering an entire gene, there are as many possible alleles as there are letters to the fourth power, he says, explanation point. Given many generations, chromosomal recombination can lead to an increasing number of alleles because the initial versions of a gene get scrambled to make more versions. And we just discussed earlier how recombination rates fit perfectly in the biblical creation model. It's the evolutionists that have to post hoc, ad hoc, rationalize the data. They also don't make testable predictions either. Um, one... one <laughs> Oh, can't make this stuff up. Like I said, one so-called testable prediction was Tiktaalik um, that damage control Dan used in one of his recent videos. So brother Neff and I, we're going to be doing uh, another evolutionist bites the dust episode, possibly this weekend, maybe Saturday or Sunday. We'll see because we also have to premiere the Dr. Rob Stadler demolition of Professor Dave. So we're going to try and fit it in, but we're going to uh, go over that so-called prediction of Tiktaalik and just put that one to bed. Okay, so Dr. Carter points out, finally over 4,500 years has gone by. That is plenty of time to account for the accumulation of a lot of genetic diversity. Take humans. The bulk of our variation is biallelic and spread throughout the world. Okay, let's stop right there. Most genes come in two versions, biallelic. Now here's what's funny. And which makes sense. We came from, you know, Adam and Eve just 6,000 years ago. Um, here's what's funny. They want to look at the exception, right? Spots in the genome where there's a lot more diversity. The exception proves the rule. But even that, uh, as you can see here, I've addressed it thoroughly with uh, Dr. Dan. He likes to use that, that argument. Uh, we also asked Dr. Carter it the other day in our interview. I'm going to show that clip too before we end. <laughs> he just gives a phenomenal answer. Nothing they can refute. All they can do now is dodge, dick, dip, duck, and dive, and dodge. That's it. So let's see here. Um, it, what's, what's amazing too about the allele frequencies, okay? They want to look to the exception to the rule, but they don't want to point out how rare the frequencies are of these certain variants. Now, as I pointed out earlier too, um, we have traces of Babel in our genetics. Okay, why chromosomes are geographically specific, gene deletions, for example. We can look at linkage blocks. The genetic data just screams the Tower of Babel. It screams Noah. It screams Noah's three daughters-in-law. It's fascinating, actually. Um, there's not a lot of mutations in general. So let's see. Um, so right here is, is the uh, mo mosaicism model, okay? This is what Swamidas thought I was using. But as I said, it, it, it just, all this means is God could have done this. We can't limit God. But it doesn't seem like it's necessary. When we look at the common um, variations in the world, there's only about 10, 15 million. Therefore, Adam would have only needed 10, 15, maybe 20 million variants. We each individually have 3 million. Throw 10 to 15 million in Adam and everything is explained. So we don't, plus the recombination rates, rates of gene conversion, mutation rates, we don't really need to invoke this, um, but it's possible. So Carter says, and there is no way to say that God did not front load Adam and Eve's reproductive cells with many different genomes, meaning that the genetic diversity of humans today may depend in part on how many children they had. There are myriad additional variants that are geographically restricted. These are excellent candidates for post-flood mutations. Given that there are over 7 billion people, and given that we have had 
2,000 years, we've had thousands of years, my apologies, for variations to arise. Why would anyone be surprised that there are genes with more than two versions? Supposedly, Dr. Dan's knocked down argument. And his other argument is recombination rates, which we've annihilated. Um, this one's a joke. Now he's trying to parrot the TMR4A from Swamidas because he's running out of arguments. Uh, but remember, there's a lot at stake here. So as we can see here, the evidence is perfectly consistent, overwhelmingly consistent with the biblical creation model. But here's the thing. I've said this many times, just, you know, why people may be confused. People like Damage Control Dan who are heavily invested in this. You know, they've gone to school for how many years? They're a professor in this. Um, a lot of times it does come down to morals, moral values. Um, they're not going to tap out. And that's where they do resort to dodgeball because, and the ones that follow these people, there's a lot of confirmation bias, right? That's why I've seen a lot of comments even recently in Dan's videos urging him to respond to standing for truth, you know, saying we always get the last word. It looks like we're winning. We're winning the debates coming from their own side because even the viewers, okay, even though a lot of what people like Dan and Swami Das and Aaron Ra, I mean, Aaron Ra doesn't even really have good arguments, but he's popular. So that's why we're going after these guys. But here's the thing. It goes over their head, but as long as they respond somehow, then they can wipe the sweat off their forehead and say, okay, you know, pine trees and whales are still related apparently, but confirmation bias. Uh, let's see here. Doki Doki. Thanks so much for the super sticker. I appreciate it. So, um, actually, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to go to Dr. Carter demolishing this argument as well. Uh, what's funny is, we, um, I really enjoyed that interview because I just, I just want to share screen, share audio. So here we go. Here we go. The areas in the genome, apparently where there are too many alleles, which we've addressed. There we go. Adam and Eve. Too much diversity in the human genome. Nope. Refuting the critics. So I'm having a good blast getting these questions out for people. Let's watch. Let's see if it's an issue. According to Dan. For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. What about the other variable regions in the genome where they find more than 400 alleles? Can this all be genetic diversity explained by the biblical time frame? So notice how, here's the exact question, right? All these different variants. Dr. Carter's nodding right away. He didn't even break a sweat. He's chilling. He's relaxed. He was drinking either his tea or coffee or water throughout the interview. He's heard these over and over again ad nauseum. That's what these guys do. Go to this peaceful discourse blog that I just went through and showed how easy it was to refute their so-called best. And just look at how much they dodge. They don't address the questions. They pretend to not understand. Evolution is all about pretend. Okay? Pretend all life we see today. Whales humans, monkeys, fish, plants, whatever, all descended from a single south like ancestor billions of years ago. And that single south like ancestor came from non-living chemicals in some unscientific process called chemical evolution. They have no answer for chemical evolution, no plausible explanation for the origin of life. Materialism is dead in the water. They have no explanation. Uh, but anyways, you can see that they've heard these over and over again. And this is why people like Dan are deceivers because they'll make their videos and they hate that we've come along and destroyed their arguments. Okay. They'll make their videos, but they won't, the, the, the impression they give off to their audience is like, these are just smack down knockout arguments. We haven't even heard about them. We've never written on them. We've never addressed them. Are you kidding me? These have been addressed years ago. We're now in 2020 where we have a testable model when it comes to a literal Adam and Eve, 
where predictions are flowing from it, retro predictions. This is the gold standard of science, but they still want to use the same old debunked arguments. They don't want to address the bigger picture. You've got Swami Das in the peaceful science page, not providing his own predictions, not really providing much of a model of his own. So this is what we're dealing with. Anyways, let's continue. Uh, yeah, in fact, usually when they're talking about that, they're talking about the HLA alleles, which are part of the immune system. Hmm. Our immune system is designed to rearrange DNA to make new antibodies. Now, those aren't necessarily inherited, but it's a highly adaptable portion of the genome. And look, we've had 6,000 years. There's 7 billion people in this world. If you take everyone's family tree and go back in time, we have all these independent branches in the family tree where lots of mutation can happen. So take a gene, you know, if a gene's, let's say, pick a number, 10,000 letters long. That's 10,000 places for a mutation to happen. If one letter change in one place makes a new allele, another letter change in another place makes another allele. It's not a big deal. Of course, there's a little diversity. And usually when they say there's all this diversity, they don't tell you what the frequency of these alleles is most of these things are incredibly infrequent they're extremely rare they're a brand new mutation just like dr carter said remember they want to deceive their audience they don't even want to give the bigger picture they don't even point out how rare these these allele frequencies are when it comes to these um areas where there are more than two alleles, for example, uh, more than 400 sometimes, as you've seen Matt asked in the uh, question wise. Um, Brother Nicholas, yes, I've been trying to get a hold of him too, especially because him and I have had hours and hours of discussion and conversation on these issues, figuring out the problems. Um, Dr. Carter has been a blessing to Jeremy and myself. Um, so I really, I really want to get a hold of him. Unfortunately, I haven't, but I'm, let's all say a prayer for him, of course. I'd love for him to know that we've had Dr. Carter on, and I know he'd be happy for that too. So I hope for the best. I've reached out to him. I haven't heard from him, unfortunately, not yet. So good question. That happened in Tajikistan or in Patagonia or in you know, Sweden, and it's only one family or in one tribe, or in one country, or one region. So most of these things are vanishingly rare to the point where you're like, okay, whatever, it's a new mutation. Why is that a big deal when there's 7 billion people? In fact, it's kind of shocking there's so little diversity amongst us. Exactly. Why is there such little diversity? Why do the allele frequencies... Why are they so perfectly consistent with a biblical creation model? I gave a 30 minute or so presentation on the hat map data. Um, Dr. Carter gives the, the same presentation with more detail, a little bit longer and how beautifully it fits with the young earth creation perspective from a literal Adam and Eve and hasn't even been addressed. Damage control Dan attempted to address that video and just ignored 99% of it, didn't even address the hat map, didn't address the Adam and Eve design diversity, allele frequencies, technical paper, um, try to use an argument from linkage blocks. When in fact, in the paper, in the paper that he says he read apparently or knows of, addresses that argument. So th this is what we're dealing with here, guys. But um, yeah, th we're, just start we're just starting here. We've got, um, Got, got a lot of great stuff planned, so uh, let's keep going. In fact, we have probably one-fifth to one-tenth of the genetic diversity of chimpanzees. That's a good a lot, lot fewer chimpanzees in the world. Isn't that funny that chimpanzees have more diversity within themselves than humans and Neanderthals do. And then they want to say ne Neanderthals are a sister species or separate species. Um, it doesn't sit well with me when, please go check out the video we just put out refuting Erica's position on Homo floresiensis, the hobbits. And the fact that they try and say that all these so-called hominins, like Erectus, floresiensis, Nelidi, Neanderthalensis, Heidelbergensis, you name it. They want to say they're pre-human. You know, they want to say, like Erica was saying, that um, 
Homo floresiensis came from some astrolopith like ancestor, maybe a, a habilis like ancestor, uh, build your own hominin, trying to say that, you know, they didn't have the brain power for purposeful navigation, when in fact all the evidence suggests that that's how the hobbits got to the island of Flores. But they're so desperate to hold on to their evolutionary based theory assumptions that they need to purport that these clearly human variants are somehow pre-human. You know, that doesn't sit well with me. Would they say if, if a Neanderthal was walking around the street today or, you know, an erectus or something like that, are they, are they going to say that they're, they're less than human? No, they're a hundred percent human. They're made in the image of God. Islands do crazy things. And that's why we see a lot of the same pathologies, a lot of the same results in these human variants that are isolated on islands. You've got Homo luzonensis, you've got Homo floresiensis, you got Nalidi, all isolated, all inbred. You know, unfortunately, this is reality. This happens oftentimes. Island dwarfism. They're humans. They're made in the in the image of God. So it's just sad that that they have to say that they're less than human. You know, I, I just doesn't sit well with me. But th that's these are the types of conclusions you have to make when you're so so um, invested in ape to man evolution. So Doki Doki says the fellowship of the monkey hobbit sailors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like your comment, Doki Doki, with Dr. Carter that he was um, he was Gandalf the Gray, but in the interview the other day, he was Gandalf the White. Um, Ramat says, well, they are running out of missing links and fast. If they lose this new hobbit, they have lost a, a huge one. It's true. That's why they're so desperate. And we had so much fun with Build Your Own Hominid the other day on Habilis and Sadiba. Because now, now this is where people who are so invested, like Guts at Gibbon, spend so much time on now. You know, these waste basket taxon, these artificial, bag of bones, literally bags of bones that you can just build your own hominid with. It's so fragmented, flimsy, pathetic. And this is because they've run out of so-called transitions. They've run out of so-called pre-humans, Neanderthals humans, Erectus humans, Floresiensis humans, um, Heidelbergensis humans, Nalidi humans, Luzonensis humans. Most of your astralopithecines, obviously, there's there's some where there's evidence that, you know, human bones from the Homo genus and ape bones were intermixed. But for the most part, when you see the australopithecines, you're looking at an ape, an ape type. You know, if they existed today, it would just be an additional ape type. Ape, ape type. So, you know, it's, it's getting pretty sad. Uh, maybe before I end it here, I want to, let's see. That was definitely a quick hour. Yeah, they. I, I want to sh show you guys how much these um, evolutionists, those that just want to hold on so dearly to the belief that requires blind faith that all life today has ultimately descended from a single cell like ancestor millions, billions of years ago. It's sad. And yet there are mechanisms for change, mutations, right? Typographical errors in attacks, genetic mistakes, essentially. Natural selection, not even, it's a fine tuning mechanism, keeps a species as strong as it can be. But apparently, you know, these mechanisms, they, um, you know, they, they'll look to gene duplication and then they want to get fancy and say, you know, neo functionalization. And this has all resulted in a single solid like ancestor to have evolved in all the life we see. It's just a lot of storytelling storyboards. And they love to say like walking fish the other day in the comment section, you know, evolution doesn't uh, predict uh, change, vertical changes. They, they predict all types of changes. Yeah. Guess what? When 99.99999% of your changes are deleterious, they're not taking things forward, they are resulting in the degradation of pre-existing systems, pre-existing information. Um, so when organismal adaptations happen, it's typically due to something breaking down. Your best beneficial mutations are reductive. Dr. Carter and uh, Ram and myself discussed this. So I love how they like to say that. Well, evolution, you know, it's, it doesn't predict a specific change. Any type of change is evolution, they say. That's why it's too slippery. We have to define terms. 
Changes in allele frequencies and populations over time. Nobody disagrees with that. Even species, they try and say macroevolution is change above the species level. Okay, new species are typically formed how? Through reductions in allelic variability. Notice the trend, reduction, loss, degradation, deleterious. Notice a trend. You're not going to take a single solid leg ancestor into a whale with these types of changes. Okay, these are the types of changes that we would expect. Reductions in allelic variability. So before we end it here, I'm going to share screen real quick just to give you guys an idea of what the critics got on their hands. Brother Nicholas says, SFT has no choice, daily battles, so he has to report to us daily or he'll never catch up. Good soldiering, brother. Yeah, I wasn't, Nicholas, you're, I wasn't even planning on, on going live today, but you know, you just, we, we love the fight on this channel. You know, we, we love the truth. We love exposing the lies. And that's why it's funny because we've asked these critics very specific questions. And a month goes by and still haven't answered the questions. And then you ask again and they say, well, we're trying to put together, you know, a video that's taken us a month to do and we're bringing the whole team together. And it, it, this just speaks to how sad their arguments are. Meanwhile, they'll put out a video and Ra and Matt will have a response the next day because they're promoting pseudoscience. And that's easy to debunk. Uh, we're promoting empirical science. So to come up with a, an hour long video of lies and dodging yeah that probably does take a month so uh let's see i'm going to share screen good to see everybody boom so guys check out new debunking the critic series uh there's there's no coming back from this we've this video uh right here this was a great one we did debunking the debunkers dr dan stern cardinal address all his so-called lines of evidence for macroevolutionary change. Um, debunking Dr. Dan, the pseudoscience man, responding to Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal. He made a review of um, one of our books, Universal or Separate Ancestry. We gave a two and a half hour response. Right here, taking down guts of Gibbon, molecular clocks, orphan genes. Yeah, definitely check, check this out, guys. They got a lot of work for him. Um, this one's awesome. Guts of Gibbon forced into early retirement. Critics still don't understand why chromosome. <laughs> she wants to say ignore most of the why, and we'll still get humans and chimps closer when it comes to the why. <laughs> I can't wait for her to come out with a response. There's an authoritative lecture on the Y chromosome dissimilarity, just how messy it is when it comes to the apes and then the humans. You know, when it comes to overall architecture, when it comes to gene content, humans and gorillas actually have a more similar Y than humans and chimps. Humans and chimps are dissimilar by 35% when you consider the overall architecture, structure, size differences, gene content. So she, her response, go read it in the um, comment section was, well, you know, we got to assume evolution. We know that, you know, chimpanzees are the odd man out and they've had deletions here, duplications there, you know, problem here, problem there. So that's why they're so different. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's actually, you can't make this stuff up. So um, there's an authoritative lecture out on that topic. I went on a rabbit trail, but I asked the question in the comment section. I says, I said, isn't it, isn't it odd or something along the lines? Is it true? Is it safe to say that human and gorilla Y are more similar than human and chimp? This is an authoritative lecture, an evolutionist lecture. And the publisher of that lecture responded the next day, said, oddly enough, yes, it's true. But these evolutionists want to essentially make things up to hold on to their theory. So, um, yeah, definitely check these out, guys. Uh, let's see. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Dr. Carter interviewed the Hobbit of Flores. Taking evolution to school on mutation rates. Yeah, it, it's been addressed. They got a lot of dodging to do, but it ain't going to work on us. So, anyways, good to see everybody. Even at this, after 5 a.m., I'm going to get some sleep.